I have the privilege of having a second kick at the can here, and um, this time I'm moderating. Uh, and I think we're in for a really um, exciting and informative panel. I think we're going to get to the real nitty gritty about some of the things that we all have a lot of questions about. I'd um, just like to get straight into it. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is Jean Gagnon. He is an independent curator, critic, and art administrator. He recently served as advisor for corporate affairs and development to Antimodular, which is the studio of um, the artist Rafa Lozano Hammer, who I noticed you had in your uh, show and was also in the Whitechapel. You might have noticed one of the slides with the eye, the roving eye that uh, responds to your biometric data. Um, he's also director of the Preservation and Access to Collections at the Cinématique Québécois in Montreal from 2010 to 2017. He was director of the Daniel Lancois Foundation for Arts and Science and Technology from 1998 to 2008. Before joining the foundation, he'd also been an associate curator of media arts at the National Gallery of Canada from 1991 to 1998. He was the initiator and member of the management committee of DOCAM Research Alliance uh, from 2005 to 2010 and co-directed co a special issue of Art Press 2 in France in the spring of 2009 entitled Media Arts, Conservation and Restoration. So as you can see, he's been uh, very involved and a very heavy player for a long time. So I look forward to welcoming you, Jean. Please take the mic. Thank you. I'm going to be here to see my slides. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Zainab for the invitation. It's a great opportunity. It's also an, also an opportunity to reconnect after many years of uh, uh, having um, been apart <laughs> in the world. Uh, thanks for the gallery here to uh, host uh, this uh, interesting conference. It's always nice to be in the company of uh, Norval Morisot, uh, among others, and uh, Emily Carr and Carl Beam. And, other painters here. So um, maybe my title here is a bit uh, pedantic. Uh, it's much more simple than that. I'm going to go over a few projects I did while I was at the National Gallery and uh, uh, some projects after the National Gallery, trying to uh, see how exhibition relates to acquisitions, among other things. So we'll go through uh, this. Obviously, I haven't tried to be uh, exhaustive. Uh, you know, I'm not, I don't pretend I can talk of, um, about every exhibition that ever uh, took place in the country. So it's really uh, that I draw on my uh, own experience. <clears throat> I didn't include anything that happened in artist-run centers where a lot of this happens, actually. Um, Digital art has been around for quite a while in Canada, as uh, many of us uh, have mentioned. And for instance, the first few uh, computer animation experiments happened in the 1960s uh, at the NFB uh, in Montreal. Uh, also at the NFB, at the beginning of the 80s, there was um, the creation of the studio Danimatic, the computer animation studio. Actually, the NFB imported a computer developed by the National Science um, Council, uh, and they started to experiment with it. And one of the person who was hired by the NFB to experiment with this computer was Daniel Langlois, who uh, later created uh, Softimage Incorporated in 1985. And for those um, who don't know, this uh, computer software was uh, instrumental in creation of films like uh, Jurassic Park at the time. Um, also, it was mentioned uh, yesterday, I think, uh, the Canada Council created the Media Arts section in 1982. 
And right off the bat, there was a program. At some point, I was responsible for that program, and it was called Computer Integrated Media. It was open uh, to all disciplines um, of practice, you know, dancers, musicians, visual artists, any artist could apply to that fund in order to explore the use of computer and informatics in the production of works. Now we go back into antiquity in the early 70s. These are three works, I mean two, two are with the photographs and uh, another one I didn't find the photographs, but uh, these are three works by Norman White that were purchased by the National Gallery in the early 70s. They were all uh, acquired from the Electric Gallery in Toronto. Uh, that gallery was active in the 70s and folded around 1980. What, uh, well, when I was at the National Gallery, the, I did an exhibition of these three works that was in 1995. Since 77 and 76, there was, these works were back in the vaults and were never exhibited again. So when obviously we uh, took them out, plugged them in the uh, circuit, <laughs> they didn't work. So obviously we had to bring the artists and he worked with the conserv conservator. Uh, at the National Gallery to repair the three works. What's interesting here, why I point uh, these dates in order to um, point one thing, which is that the gallery, the National Gallery was interested in this artist as long as he was handled by a gallery, by an um, art dealer. And I think it's something that have, has not been uh, really addressed by anybody or men barely mentioned the question or the role of um, art dealers in acquisition uh, of museums. Very often curators go shop uh, at art dealers. They don't shop much outside of, I'm talking about, you know, uh, contemporary art. Uh, curators in, in museums. So here we have an example of an artist who eventually was not, um, or the gallery didn't continue any interest in his work. Um, and my only supposition is that, well, there was no gallerist uh, taking care of his work anymore, so they, they lost interest. Uh, maybe there's other explanation, but I don't know uh, what, it, what it would be. Anyway, it's a fact that between 77 and 95, these works were not shown. And since 95, I don't think they have been shown uh, again. Uh, that's a uh, work by uh, Le Courchain, Portrait One, that I showed in 93, 94. And eventually, the gallery purchased the piece in '97. Um, this is one of the first piece interactive work that was entering the National Gallery's collection. Uh, this work, one notable uh, fact about this work is that it run, it's still run apparently on the original system, which is a Mac SE and it was programmed with HyperCard. When I purchased the, the work, I purchased all the original elements. So there's a one-inch videotape with the video footage, all the HyperCard printed, uh, so that eventually, if, if need be, to reconstruct the piece, we could uh, reprogram it uh, from the printouts and obviously the computers and everything else. Another piece I uh, got for the collection at the National Gallery is Room of One's Own by uh, the American artist Lynn Hirschman. And it was part first of an exhibition uh, called Lynn Hirschman Vir Virtually Yours. 
And this piece is a um, peep show, basically. Uh, so the, spect the visitor comes and looks into this um, uh, little window there. And you see a little dollhouse. And you have a, ca um, a video, small video uh, screen with a female character talking to you and uh, basically ad um, addressing you as a voyeur. George Le Grady, we did a big retrospective. It was uh, actually a, co um, um, a collaboration between the, uh, the Museum of Contemporary Photography that doesn't exist anymore and the National Gallery. And we showed the early photographs by George Lagridi, but George Lagridi in the 80s started to work with digital imaging. So very early, he started to um, create images through digital means uh, and printouts. And later on in the 90s, he did the interactive um, works. And, uh, in that particular case, exhibition, we uh, produced a catalog which was a CD-ROM. So um, with the artist, we uh, produced that interactive uh, catalog. Uh, obviously, CD-ROMs tried to, a CD-ROM made in the mid-90s, try to play it now, it won't play. So eventually, the Daniel Landra Foundation um, uh, Ported, ported it to the web. So you have the uh, web address uh, down there if you want to see uh, this catalog. One uh, thing I started to do at the National Gallery was to commission work. Uh, this morning we heard about residencies. Pro re residency programs are one way to um, have uh, people um, uh, or uh, help artists produce new work. Uh, commissioning the work is another uh, way of doing it. Um, this particular one is uh, Catherine Richards' uh, Charged Arts. Actually, this was a collaboration between Catherine, the National Research Council in Ottawa, some private uh, high-tech companies in the uh, Ottawa region, and the National Gallery. Uh, which allowed the artists to produce uh, this new piece uh, involving um, two um, glass art, actually biologically um, accurate uh, glass arts that would be charged with um, uh, some gas. I don't remember all the details, but eventually the spectator would enter the room, touch uh, those um, glass uh, container and then it would take your pulse and the two arts, if two people were there, would synchronize and in the middle it would create, uh, it's called a terella, it would create um, a, a, it's a phenomenon we see in the northern sky, um, northern lights, uh, So this was a piece commissioned by the National Gallery. We had to fund it also through uh, some fundraising. And we went to the AT&T Foundation uh, to complete uh, the funding. Another commission was with uh, Bill Seaman, an American artist. I had met uh, B Bill Seaman in uh, Karlsruhe in the mid-90s before the ZKM was uh, finished, uh, the building, I mean, was finished. So the, uh, Jeffrey Shaw at the time was doing a, a yearly festival. So I went there and met with uh, Bill. I saw some of his work there. And eventually I said to him, because uh, his work is based on what he calls recombinant poetics. And um, so he's interested in poetics. 
And I said to him, I said, do you know if Mallarmé is a uh, coup de déjà mené bolira le hasard? And he said, oh, yes, of course, it's a great uh, influence on my uh, thinking. So I said, would you like to adapt uh, the poem? Uh, and he said, yes. So that's how we came about to work on adapting that uh, famous Mallarmé's poem um, as an interactive uh, piece. And the piece is bilingual, so we have the Malamé's text in French, and we have the English translation of Malamé's text, plus text that uh, the artist um, added to uh, the piece. Uh, how it worked? I didn't have a commission budget at the National Gallery. It didn't exist. So I had to use exhibition fund and partly also acquisition fund. So part of the contract was that we pay traveling expenses, an artist's fee for the production time. We bring in the National Gallery had a TV studio, so we provided the cameras. In those days, we were shooting in Betacam SP, big cameras. Um, so we provided the equipment and so on. So the artists came in the Ottawa region and for a few days we went around and shoot, shot uh, different images that we see in the piece. And then he worked with his um, um, uh, programmer to program the piece, so we paid you know, the fee for the programmer. It was all laid out in the contract, and there was a, a, a clause in the contract that w was saying, if ever the National Gallery wants to acquire the work, we will add another sum of so much dollars, and the piece will be uh, kept in, within the, collect the collection. Eventually, that's what happened. Uh, the piece is uh, part of the National Gallery's collection uh, now. Shaw Davies' uh, Ephemer, uh, which is our second piece, um, virtual reality piece. The first one was Osmos. Osmos had been presented during ISEA conference in '95 in Montreal at the Musée d'Art Contemporain. And eventually, I decided to invite her to present Ephemer at uh, the National Gallery. In those days, these pieces were running on silicon graphics stations. Computers worth like $500,000. And so we could put it off because Softimage was, was backing. Uh, Charles Davies was the vice president of uh, Softimage. So the company was backing the, the project. So we could uh, afford <laughs> to have uh, the necessary uh, computers, equipment to do such a project. In 2007, I did an, an exhibition at the Muse Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, which was called E-Art, New Technologies and Contemporary Art, that was celebrating 10 years of the Daniel Landlois Foundation. So we presented 10 artists, works by 10 artists, but a total of 20-something uh, works. Um, uh, we had a piece by Jessica Field, who's here. <laughs> and um, you see all the other artists there. After the show, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts per, uh, purchased a few works, uh, those two. Um, actually, I think from Jim Campbell, they, they purchased a few of those uh, screens. Uh, because they are, you know, pieces, uh, one screen piece. So I think they purchased a few of those. And from David Rockaby, uh, they purchased this uh, major installation called Scene. I have two minutes. I just wanted to mention other uh, galleries that uh, has been involved with, you know, art and science, art and technology. One of those is the Ontario Art Gallery, uh, which held an exhibition of uh, Juan Guire's work in '93, 
And coming up, um, Caroline Langill is curating a sh new show of uh, Guire's work, paired with other artists that were influenced by uh, Guire's. Um, the Oakville Galleries did a major solo show with uh, David Ro Rokeby in the mid-2000, in 2004 actually. And this particular piece here, uh, Machine for Taking Time, which is a great, great piece, um, was commissioned for that uh, uh, space. And eventually, I did commission a version of that for Montreal that was shown in the building of the Landra Foundation, Excentris in Montreal. And uh, it was called Machine for Taking Time Boulevard Saint Laurent. And it was two screens, actually. And finally, uh, Raphael Lozano Hemer had this major solo exhibition at the, at the Musée d'Art Contemporain just the past summer, and uh, showing something like 26 works, I think it was. Um, so uh, the Musée d'Art Contemporain being a contemporary art museum, um, obviously has over the years shown you know, quite a bit of uh, video, new media, and uh, has been fairly good in, uh, in committing towards that kind of practice. So maybe my two points here is uh, twofold. Uh, one is that uh, galleries may act as producers. They have to have the will to, to do so, but they, they can act as producers. And then you have to you know, make a deal with the artists in order to produce the work, acquire the work, or let the work go with, with the artists. Uh, for instance, at the National Gallery, it has happened that some work were commissioned, but not acquired. So the artist goes with his or her work and uh, you know, keeps all the copyrights and everything. And uh, the second point is that I do think that you need some, some sort of specialized knowledge as a curator. I'm not talking about technical knowledge. I'm talking about knowledge of the networks where these artists work and show their work that are often outside of the regular venues or art fairs. Although lately we've seen more and more of that type of work, like Raphael shows in major art, art fairs, but not all, all artists do. And also there's all, there, there's all those new practice that are not represented here in what I showed you, uh, that happens on the web or other virtual spaces that uh, a specialized curator would know about and would be able to bring to a gallery. Now, if, you, if a gallery cannot have such a specialized uh, curator on staff, well, make room for inviting those uh, people once in a while. One of the problems we face sometimes uh, is that galleries have their staff and they uh, are very um, timid let's say, in opening up to other curatorial proposals. So I think it's a very important uh, point to make that uh, knowledge and special, it's a specialized field. And uh, you have to go around uh, to be in contact with the works and the artists and be able to uh, bring those to the public eventually. Thank you. there with a mic and do it. Okay, that's what I'll do next time. So um, our second speaker is David Bobier, and um, David is a media artist who's been active in and for the deaf and disability arts um, for over two decades. He's a parent of two deaf children and he lives in nature on the outskirts of London, Ontario, not the United Kingdom. 
His creative practice is incorporating research and development of vibrotactile technology as a creative medium. This vibrotactile technology, originally developed for the deaf, is essential in Bobier's artistic practice for developing more accessible ways of creating and experiencing art in its many forms. This work led to his establishment of Vibrofusion Lab in London, Ontario in 2014, a creative multimedia, multi-sensory researching and supporting inclusive technologies for supporting arts practices for greater accessibility to the arts in general. He's also a founder and past chair of London, Ontario Media Arts Association, member of the Board of Media Arts Network Ontario, and founder and co-chair of Inclusive Arts London. He's recently received funding from the Canada Council, the Ontario Arts Council, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, um, the Ontario Centres for Excellence, and the British Council of Canada. He's going to speak to us on a very new and exciting topic that I think um, is going to be new for most of us, and so I'm really looking forward to hearing this. Thanks. Welcome, David. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, and thank you to uh, uh, all the members of OAG or staff that have been involved in organizing this and uh, also Robert McLaughlin Gallery staff, thank you so much. Um, uh, I really appreciate being here. Um, I never get totally comfortable doing this <laughs> uh, and I sometimes uh, have fits of anxiety but if you'll just kind of bear with me we'll, we'll work through this. I'm sort of relying uh, more on visual content than talking. So, um, um, also if, um, if this were a fully inclusive um, uh, program, which I know certainly all attempts were made uh, to do that, but uh, initially I would describe myself. Uh, so, um, I, I will bypass that because I assume Here's all of... Here's what I found on the web for a program. With me all the towns were made. To do that, describe... <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't planned. <laughs> hey, stop it! <laughs> Sheesh. Um, there we go, already. Uh, I think that speaks highly of technology. Um, I'm going to uh, start... Also, the other thing I would say is that um, a, a relaxed program, chairs would be situated wherever, you know, we felt like situating them. There would be giant bean bags all over the place, because um, you know sometimes we get a little uncomfortable sitting on chairs. But anyway, all of that as a as an, a bit of an aside, um, I'm going to, in all modesty, um, read this uh, short um, passage uh, from an exhibition that I curated called Vibrofusion Lab: uh, Bridging. Uh, Bridging Practices in uh, Accessibility Art and Communication. Uh, and it was, uh, the essay was written by Eliza Chandler, uh, who um, is a prof at uh, uh, disability, Critical Disability Studies at Ryerson University. Um, <clears throat> in 2014, media artist David Bobier opened Vibrofusion Lab in London, Ontario, uh, in collaboration with Inclusive Media and Design Center uh, at Ryerson University. Uh, Vibrofusion Lab, uh, run by Bobier and populated by various multimedia and multidisciplinary artists from around the world, is an interactive, multidisciplinary, multisensory, multimodal, creative studio and ideation space that serves as a hub for research, creation, collaboration, mentorship, and exhibition opportunities. All of the energies and activities at Vibrofusion Lab are focused on the creation of new accessible art forms through inclusive technologies, including vibrotactile technology, which is turning sound into motion, um, as a creative medium that expands art-making practices and extends art-engaging experiences. 
um, I can confidently guess that there are no other collaborative research and creation spaces like Viber Fusion Lab in the world. Um, I, I don't know if she really researched that, but we'll go with it. Um, uh, and, <laughs> The genius and sheer innovation of this collaboration is the way that it brings together artists and scientists to make emerging, inclusive, or adaptive technology accessible to artists of all disciplines and of all abilities. In doing so, Vibrofusion Lab contributes not only to the requirement to make artwork accessible, but also to the abundant, creative, and innovative opportunity that comes with this requirement. In short, Vibrofusion Lab and the technologies, ideas, and instruction that it offers has dramatically changed the way we make and experience art. So, thank you, Eliza. Um, so, uh, London, Ontario is a population of about 350 people, just as a little bit of background. Um, known in the art community for uh, regionalism uh, in the 60s with uh, people like Greg Curnow and Murray Fabro, which has already been mentioned, people like that. I still think, I think we're st still getting, trying to come to terms with that period of time, and uh, London, I don't think, wants to sort of get over it. Um, so uh, I think what happens in a lot of cases, or in my experience, is that you're sort of working under the radar all the time in London and not uh, really sort of, the community doesn't really engage that much with uh, the sort of more underground activities. Um, so um, even though I operated this space for uh, a number of years in London, what has really happened is it's sort of branched out and um, a lot of my work is actually happening outside of London. Um, so I'm going to, um, uh, I've got three videos that I'm going to show uh, of three artists that I've worked with uh, through Vibrofusion Lab. And um, so the artists will essentially for the most part be talking about their own experiences um, and giving you some kind of background of the work that you're going to be seeing. Um, so next, uh, but before we get into that, <laughs> um, this is sort of the mantra of Vibrofusion Lab, which um, hasn't really changed much over the last six, uh, seven years. Um, it, it did evolve out of a supportive uh, partnership with Inclusive Media and Design Center. Um, they were working on developing a, uh, a theater chair for the deaf, a vibrotactile theater chair for the deaf, and um, uh, I approached them uh, to talk about the, the ways that that kind of technology could be applied uh, into art making practice. Um, and they were very inclusive, and we worked together for a number of years. Um, so it's an interactive creative research studio that promotes and encourages the creation of new accessible art forms and languages of communication. I, I, I put a great deal of emphasis on languages of communication because I think we have various ways of communicating beyond me standing here and talking. Um, so that's a, a kind of a big aspect or a big sort of um, background around Vibrofusion Lab is how, how we can communicate on, on different levels and through different forms. Um, so, Vibrofusion Lab investigates the potential of vibration as a form of artistic expression and artistic enjoyment. So, looking at vibration as a medium independent, uh, independently. Um, and then, uh, uh, Vibrofusion Lab explores emerging adaptive technologies. Um, so, always kind of looking at uh, new technologies that are being developed specifically to support certain physical, uh, emotional uh, needs, but thinking about sort of reconfiguring uh, or reimagining that technology as a tool um, for art making uh, and abides by the social model of deafness and disability. I don't think I have to explain that. <laughs> um, okay, next please. Yeah, so here it is. <laughs> I guess I do have to explain it. <laughs> um, uh, social model of disability says that disability is caused by the way society is organized uh, rather than by a person's impairment or, or difference. Uh, it looks at ways of removing barriers that restrict life choices for disabled people. Next. Um, I always was sort of attracted by this uh, notion that vibration is life and I think if we think about it, it pretty much is. Um, we're, we're cellularly vibrating right now um, and uh, we're also vibrating through sound, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, whoops. Yep, ha, back. I 
Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, there. Okay, um, so this is um, one, one artist that I worked with, and she's from Montreal, uh, Mo Clark, um, uh, multidisciplinary Métis artist, uh, looping pedal mistress, spoken word poet, educator, artistic producer, public speaker, and activist. Um, so I invited, um, oh, I should talk a little bit about, just very briefly, Virofusion Lab has functioned essentially through um, project grants. Um, plus uh, various associations with universities and sort of mm, in some fortunate way getting connected with some CERT, CERT uh, funding along the way. Um, so uh, through uh, project funding, I uh, invited Mo Clark to come to the lab um, and she said, I just have one sort of um, thing that I want to investigate and that's water uh, and, and how, how can we work with water. Um, so. Steve, I'm not sure if you recall, oh, but the last it. time ATW visited no, the back, Tangled back, back. Art sorry, Gallery... Sorry, sorry. There. That should be a video. Is that not a video? Yeah. Thank you. So this was a projection, obviously, taken off of the, uh, from the floor and, and, and uh, projected over top of her. <laughs> okay, you can clap that one, thanks. Um, the next one was a really interesting one. Um, uh, so it was this, this exhibition took place at Tangled Art Gallery in, in Toronto. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's uh, a new gallery opened at 401 Richmond under the direction of Tangled Art plus Disability. Um, and it's uh, modeled or it's, it's, it's um, situated as the only fully accessible gallery space in Canada. Uh, and so part of their role is to be a, um, a, a model essentially for other galleries uh, to approach and to um, uh, develop their own, you know, pro, uh, more accessible programming in their own uh, institutions. So, um, so Deirdre Logue, um, some of you, many of you may well know her. She's a, a very prominent Canadian uh, artist, uh, arts administrator. Her performance based film, video, and installation works are self portraits uniquely located between comfort and trauma, self liberation, and self annihilation. Steve, I'm not sure if you recall, but the last time ATW visited the Tangled Art Gallery here in Toronto, there was a very unique exhibition on display. Oh yeah, I remember. It was an interesting installation by Vanessa Dion Fletcher called Own Your Cervix. You got it. And while the current artist works in a more traditional medium, video, she once again challenges established conventions of the art world. She sure does. Deidre Logue's Admiring All We Accomplish was created in collaboration with Vibra Fusion Lab. And it's that partnership that makes the exhibition so great for the blind and low vision community. Vibrational haptics allow visitors to experience the audio and video in a way I have never heard of before at an art gallery. And because it's tangled, the accessibility features don't end there. Recently, staff and volunteers were trained to give live described tours. AMI special correspondent Kathleen Forrestal visited Deirdre's exhibition and got a tour. I'm very intrigued. As someone who is legally blind, the thought of visiting a video art exhibition isn't something I would normally be excited about. But when I learned artist Deirdre Logue included haptic tactile elements as part of admiring all we accomplished at the Tangled Art Gallery, I couldn't wait to check it out. 
There are three video art installations with tactile audio objects attached. The uh, work is all video and it's all performance for the camera. So that's me performing in a variety of different settings and contexts. So it has my body in it, sort of the self as subject, and in this case it's all work that's best suited to maximize the capacities of tactile audio technologies. Another cool element that made this show perfect for me was the newly added live described tours. And I was lucky enough to be guided by two wonderful volunteers, Marlena and Victoria. This piece is called Big Agnes. This is a single channel video projected onto the left hand wall of the gallery. Curator in residence, Sean Lee, feels this edition was a no brainer. The verbal description training was kind of a natural next step for us. Um, we already have the guided tours in which we work with artists and with outside resources to create a guided tour. But part of the, the reason why this was really a great training for us was that it, it helped us to engage with members of the blind and low vision communities. So what that means is we work with the transcript provided through the artist but also are able to interject things like a subjective narrative. It provides us that opportunity to create the best of both worlds. So this tour is approximately 10 minutes long and describes three video installations. In this the described tour was very cool, but it is Deirdre's partnership with Vibrafusion Lab's David Bobier that helped create works that invite visitors to interact and experience the pieces with several senses. Just stop for a sec. Yeah. I sat down. Thank you. Um, so this is um, these fiber tactile floors were designed specifically to match the size of the video, uh, the, the um, uh, four videos on the wall. You'll notice that the video monitors are about this high, so lowering them, uh, and also the, the floors were ramped so that you could go up onto them with wheelchairs, etc. So you know, thinking about the audience, who, is, who might be attending, what, what, what are their needs in terms of being uh, able to uh, fully explore and enjoy the work. Um, okay, we're gonna quickly go ahead here to um, the next, I've got two more videos that are about, uh, okay, so very briefly going into this project that's right happening at the moment uh, is with Chisato Minamamura uh, who's a London-based, London, UK-based uh, deaf artist uh, born in uh, Japan. Um, so she, the project we're working on is called Scored in Silence, uh, designed for small, relaxed performance spaces. Scored in Silence explores the hidden perspectives of deaf survivors, uh, Hibakasha, uh, of the atom bombs that fell in uh, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Uh, their lived experiences and the impact afterwards. Um, she's collected stories uh, by going to Japan uh, and interviewing survivors and also collecting archival material. Um, and it includes, uh, so she's always worked a lot with sound visualization, uh, but sort of wanted to move into vibra tactile into her work. Um, so we were able to partnership with a company called Wooger, which just came out with a very recently with a belt, a vibrotactile belt, um, or as they call it a strap, uh, which you can put on and you get the vibration without the sound, which is quite surprising. Um, so what we did was we were able to um, uh, provide uh, 40 of these uh, uh, straps or belts for the audience. Uh, and then we de designed with um, Jim Ruxton from uh, originally from Subtle Technologies, uh, now working independently as an engineer and media artist uh, to develop two uh, vibra tactile systems that were uh, built into her costume and placed on her shoulder blades. Uh, and it was operated through a Sennheiser um, uh, um, microphone system, so it was wireless. Uh, so she was feeling the sound production on her body as, as it was uh, taking place. Um, instantaneously. So it was a fully immersive, everyone was sort of experiencing the same thing. Okay, um, she's gonna in, just briefly talk about, this is sort of the uh, trailer. Hello. I'm Hello, I'm Chisato. I'm, I'm a performer and artistic director. 
And I'm going to tell you a bit about my latest project. It's called Scored in Silence. And it tells the story of the history from 1945 when America dropped the first atomic bomb in my country, Japan, in two cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Recently, I met a deaf survivor. And when I heard these stories, it had a huge impact on me. I started to research and interview, collecting these stories from other deaf survivors, and I've used these to create my new project. It has a lot of elements. It includes signed language and a new fabric called Hologold. It uses animation, images and lighting. as well as sound. And obviously for some of our deaf audience members yeah. they won't be able to access this soundscape but they will be able to feel it using one of these belts. No. It's mm. called a wuja and it vibrates very powerfully mm. meaning that you can access the performance visually with sound and through the feeling. See you there. Hope to see you there. We'll pass over the next one. Oh, uh, yeah, and then just to uh, back. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so uh, that opened just recently at the Dig Digital uh, Brighton Digital Festival, uh, and next week we're going to be opening at the uh, Manchester Science Festival. Um, and my hope is in 2020 spring to bring it to Canada. Uh, so if anyone's interested <laughs> in hosting, um, uh, so these are uh, just quickly. These are some of the artists that we've worked with over the last. Uh, six, seven years, and organizations as well. Um, some of them are familiar uh, to some of you. Um, I think just the next one. And uh, thanks. I'm sorry I went over time, but thank you so much. Our next speaker is Zach Pearl. Um, Zach is an American-Canadian designer, curator, and post-secondary educator with a critical focus on the intersection of art and technology. Since relocating to Toronto, Zach has produced events and publications for a variety of venues, including the Art Gallery of Ontario, Textile Museum of Canada, V-Tape, the Gladstone Hotel, Artscape Young Place, and InterAccess, among others. He's the former artistic director of the Subtle Technologies Festival, which provided a platform for emergent multidisciplinary practices. Zach is also the co-founder and managing editor of Capsula, a digital publication for the experimental art writing. And um, as I understand it, he's currently uh, pursuing a PhD. I don't know how he does all of this. Um, he, he can't possibly have any free time whatsoever. 
Um, he's going to be speaking to us about programming online exhibitions in a post-internet ecology. Thank you again to OAG and RMG for organizing this. Um, just a quick plug since it was already mentioned, but Capsula is actually set to produce a publication that documents this forum, which we're very excited about. Um, and so hopefully we will find a way to um, let you all know when that comes out in the new year. Um, so today I want to talk about something that was mentioned this morning, um, which is post-internet culture, and I'm referring to it here as post-internet ecology. Um, Obviously, I'm talking about this in the context of online exhibitions. There's a real cultural shift that's gone on in the mediascape over the last 10 to 12 years. And online exhibitions, the way that we maybe think about them now, is probably realistically not the way that they really function or, in my opinion, deserve to be um, exhibited and engaged with by um, museums and public galleries and other cultural institutions such as artist-run centers. Today, obviously, we're concentrating on museums and public galleries. Um, just briefly, if you're not familiar with the term post-internet, do not worry, it does not mean that the internet is over. It means that we have arrived in a time where we are actively living with the internet and in a way where it actually bleeds over the virtual into our physical everyday lives, which I think we can all probably attest to having that as a lived experience. Um, the term was actually first created by a German-American artist, Marisa Olsen, um, several years ago, and she kind of started this whole ball rolling unintentionally, um, but she created a new way of thinking about how the internet um, has a role, and it was actually, as it's been stated many times earlier, um, artists were very influential in creating this kind of new paradigm of thinking. Before I get to my first slide, I also will just say briefly that um, my master's thesis was about the death of the virtual exhibition. Um, this was my claim um, that was actually based on a statement, a paper by Patrick Lighty, who is a very well-respected um, artist and curator himself and was involved in the net.art movement in the late 90s. And he said that even though art online continues to persist, online art is largely over. And he doesn't mean that we don't have people who are making art online. Um, we obviously definitely do, and more and more in ways that are networked um, and kind of invisibly so. But what he was trying to get at is that the political movement that was net art in the 90s has really passed us. And it's more about the idea of how uh, the social, the realm of the social, is governing those kinds of interactions. Okay, so here's my premise, which really, I'll be truthful with you, is more of a provocation. So if it makes you a bit uncomfortable, don't worry. Um, so virtual exhibitions, in the familiar sense anyway, um, I would argue are largely outdated because they're based on tropes of the late 1990s and the early 2000s, um, or what we can kind of uncomfortably say is the turn of the century at this point. So here's my line of reasoning. So even though they, we, they were definitely and have always been as sort of web art or online art, however you want to phrase it, has been interactive, um, early online exhibitions were a passive kind of usership, which is a tricky kind of terminology, but there wasn't the participatory element that, we were used, that we're now very much used to since Web 2.0 technologies beginning around 2004 started to arrive. And so it also means that largely these were interactions that were meant for a single user, um, usually in a stationary location. You know, at that time, most of us did not have, as I struggled to grasp it, these things. We had this, but much larger and much heavier. Um, at that same time, it also created a kind of, and I was happy to see that somebody was referencing Janet Murray, it created a kind of desktop theater, which is not a bad thing, but it also means that there is not a cross-platform kind of mentality to it where we can walk out and experience it on multiple devices in multiple spaces. And so all of these things have changed quite a bit since then. Um, so my argument here is that online exhibitions need to now reflect the protocols of those mobile, digital, and network technologies that we interact with and are part of this larger cultural framework of a post-internet ecology. 
So I'll outline just briefly what that involves. So the first one I think we can all agree with, that our mo at least in the developed Western world, our lives are very saturated with mobile network technologies. We rely increasingly on big data infrastructures that are largely, unfortunately, invisible to us, and that was discussed at various points yesterday. Um, as users, or as I'll say in a, f in a few minutes, you know, more so producers in this space, we're also required to manage many different types of, you know, content and navigating between them simultaneously that Hito Stereo calls a dynamic viewing space. And I'm not sure if Faisal is still here, but he was on the panel yesterday. And um, he was doing uh, the, the sort of live tweeting visualizations from Nuit Blanche, and there were people performing, there were projections, people were on their phones. This is the kind of dynamic viewing space that um, Stereo is arguing um, that we now are very much embedded in. Um, a post-internet ecology desires networked objects, otherwise known as the Internet of Things, things that communicate with one another, um, that are automated and responsive environments that adapt to us. Um, it embraces plurality and at the same time, weirdly, flatness that the digital culture kind of gives us everything all at once and sometimes it's a bit too much to handle. Um, it prizes the referential, the social, and the participatory. And most importantly, in my view, it definitely creates users who are also called upon to be cultural producers. Um, and so that's kind of the crux of where I'm going with this. Now, just quickly as a visual way, this is a very um, important early piece of net art by Olia Lialina called My Boyfriend Came Back from the War. And I think that just the layout of this in an HTML frame set at the time in 1996 gives us the idea that we are dealing with a kind of dynamic viewing space, but it's very structured in a way and largely makes sense to us still. The idea here is that you click on various hyperlinks and they open up new pieces of content and it's kind of like an ever unfolding graphic novel in different pieces. But then if we contrast this to a more recent piece, so here we have Attract Money, which is from last year, I'm sorry I left the date off, 2017 by um, Michael Barras, also known as System. Um, you can see that there is an imbrication of these things. It's layered, it's self-referential, you can see the browser windows within the composition. Parts of the image protrude into one another, not violently perhaps, but in a kind of confusing, convoluted manner. And this is the sort of visualized reality of a person in a post-internet ecology is what I would argue. So here are my very practical recommendations, which I'm also kind of calling reformations, to be a bit cheeky, that I think that um, museums and public galleries really need to address if they want to start thinking about more dynamic online exhibitions. Sorry, this is a bit dim. Um, you should probably never use a coral color typeface in a situation where there are large bulbs. Um, so, uh, I'm gonna go through, so each one of the top headers will change, but these three points will remain the same, and I'm just going to give you some examples, some good, some not so good of what I think are, you know, um, pertinent here. So this is not my idea. This has been argued actually by a few different people that online exhibitions need to move towards the idea of online platforms. This is what we already are used to engaging with. When we think about Twitter or Facebook, or um, I was having a conversation with somebody about uh, Ello, if anybody remembers that as a brief blip in the cultural landscape. Um, these platforms allow people to not only um, see and interact with things, but it's, it's around a database where they can add, they can comment, they can share, and these are the online behaviors that we have incorporated into our lives. Um, so I would argue that institutions, rather than creating online exhibitions that might just be hyperlinks within a custom designed web portal, need to create platforms based on artifacts, which are the artworks, and treat them as data and make spaces that are specifically for um, building upon those, ob those artifacts and engaging a community around it. And the important thing about this too is that, in my words, it registers the social engagement, which is a fancy way of saying that you can see when people are interacting online with the artworks and with each other. 
Um, okay, so I won't spend too much time on this because it's my own work, um, but this was the result of my MFA thesis, which was uh, the research creation component was to do an online exhibition in a new way, new in quotations. Um, basically what it involved were three different artists um, and their artworks that you could see and interact with simultaneously at the same time that there was a virtual message board. And the thing that I did to kind of um, radicalize this space is that I got rid of all of the different privileges and everyone was not only an editor, but they were administrators of the space. So when you signed onto this online portal, you had complete control over the website as much as I did when I was putting it together. And this I modeled off of an idea from 2006 in a very interesting book, if anybody is so inclined, called Curating Immateriality. Um, the editor, Joey Zakrija, calls this method software curating in which you design the conditions of the exhibition, but you cannot know the results of what will actually happen because it's completely dependent on how your users slash visitors um, perform within that space. And I'll just go to another image here. Um, unfortunately, what happened, although some people did engage with this in quite a dynamic way, you know, this is why we do research. Sometimes these things, these propositions fail. And... Unfortunately, most people kind of resorted to the shyness or timidness that they would within a physical gallery space. However, the great thing that came out of it is that certain people sort of branched off and had their own conversations, but it was all visible. And remarkably, a lot of the users logged in to be spectators and to watch the discourse that was happening around these artworks. And so I would argue that the main function of the exhibition was actually to be witnessing the discourse around the artworks and not the exhibition necessarily of the artworks themselves, to a degree. You know, we don't want to undermine the artworks, but it was really more of a dynamic social space in that way. Another example of this that I look to as inspiration and which is often cited by um, curators and practitioners, um, uh, both of the sort of net art era and now today who are thinking of critically about um, networked art is Run Me, which was started out as an online festival of software art. So unlike web art, which you access through your um, you know, worldwide web protocol, these were programs that artists had designed that you would download onto your computer and actually play them to experience them. But the remarkable thing about Run Me is that it's all user driven. So this is a community of creators at different levels of professionalization and expertise, and they actually run the, the platform themselves. And so it is user generated in that way. And what it would take for an institution is to create the beginnings of this and then to invite a community of stakeholders, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, who are dedicated and committed and will take this on. And it actually has, a, it, has it continues today. It's been, uh, let me see, 2003. So here we are 15 years into the future. Um, now, one, I won't spend too much time dogging it, but there are more recent attempts at this. Um, Peer to Space in Europe um, is the work of two um, curators slash art administrators. And if we had more time, I would take you into the website and show you. They create online exhibitions that are community driven in the way that their community of users can propose exhibitions but they are not participatory. They are interactive, but there's no means to comment, to share, to have a kind of discourse about it, or to add or um, uh, kind of you know, further the project along. And so there's a real gap there in between that and what we're used to experiencing in other online avenues. Okay, my second point is that online exhibitions, and this is kind of um, goes as well for the physical space of an institution that would be supporting this, is that online exhibitions need to move into mixed realities. Um, because the original political idea of net art was that you experience it through your screen because you're circumventing the gallery. It was to disrupt the power dynamic and the authoritative voice of the institution. However, Increasingly, in post-internet culture, especially my own students at OCAD, who are now born in the year 2000 or later, possibly, have grown up in a world where they are navigating physical and virtual space simultaneously, 
quite a lot. And so this is what they're used to, this is how they engage with the world, and mixed reality environments are natural to a certain degree to them. Now, there's, I can't get into the whole, there is a whole history and discourse around what is a mixed reality environment, but my argument here comes from James Meyer, who talks about the idea of a functional site, that you need to have hybrid spaces that create and again visualize the social engagement around what the artwork is. And I think that you can only really do that through, oh, can only really do that through hybrid environments where there is access to the digital and also somehow bringing people together in a physical way as well. I just have this real quick quote from myself up here because it's interesting to go back and look at what you said seven to eight years ago. Um, I argued against this for a while, the idea that you should ever put net art in a physical locality, but just briefly, although traditional definitions of site specificity have regarded virtual space as its antithesis, both concepts involve the construction of networks and relational forms that spatialize discourse and otherwise invisible social forces. So in other words, it may not be sort of politically kosher, for, let's say, to have someone who's making art to circumvent the gallery and put that in a physical gallery space. But what's really important is that drawing the parallel between the network that they're using to disseminate and decentralize also relates to the idea that we are a network society that increasingly views this as some kind of analog or metaphor for how we relate to each other. And those things need to come together in a meaningful way, is what I would argue. I'll just really talk, quickly talk about Speed Show and then zoom to my last point. Um, this is something that I've looked at for many years. It's a great model that kind of does all of these things. It was started by a curator named Aaron Bartol in Germany um, in 2010. And the really basic idea is you throw a bunch of computers, or maybe in this case iPads, into a trunk or a trailer. You find an internet cafe or somewhere with a reliable high-speed internet connection and you move the show out of the museum or the gallery into the community and you invite people to come interact with these artworks and also to interact with each other. Um, and it's been, one of the best things about it is that it tries to also do this software curating where the same, it's never the same curator slash organizer. It's passed off to somebody else within the community and they organize and complete the next show. Okay, I'm running a little bit short on time. I wanted to uh, at least acknowledge the wrong, um, the wrong biennial. If you have not seen this um, at all, it is probably, uh, in recent years, it's made the biggest splash in terms of the continuation of web art as a practice. I have some problems with it, um, but it does at least, it, um, some events like this, GIF Fest 3000, which took place in Vancouver um, and was organized by Erica Lepat at Jansen, um, they do make sort of spin-off events in physical spaces that actually put the work, in this case, they took all the gifts from the virtual pavilion and projection mapped them onto the ceiling of this abandoned warehouse building. So there are efforts, and they had a huge turnout, I'll just... Um, as you can see over on the right, sorry, it's a bit dim, but um, it was very dancey, kind of ravey, but it was, it was of that culture. And I think that there is a real need to try and figure out who you are speaking to with, just because it's, it's networked doesn't mean that you're reaching everyone simultaneously. Okay, I'll go past that and on to my final point. So, um, Online exhibitions, as I've already said, this idea of software curating, I really, I did want to challenge what was said yesterday, um, that we should maybe um, just <laughs> dismiss the idea that visitors slash users can play a part in the curatorial models that institutions use to create exhibitions, because these kinds of things have been going on for quite a while. Michelle Kasparak at V2 in Rotterdam has been doing this a lot with laboratories as galleries and vice versa. Um, uh, Susan Fox in Australia, she created a online performance space called Waterwheel that is user defined and she manages it, but people drive the content. So these things can happen. Um, I think that it's really important though to figure out who you are speaking to and then get them to care about it and get them to commit to it. How do you do this in a way that's kind of seamless? You curate it to make 
it matter? So you engender a defined community of users. And this is a question that museums and public galleries are continually asking themselves. How do you create relevance by actually figuring out who you're trying to speak to? Um, this is me again, mostly. This was sort of an exercise in me going back to what I had written many years ago and going, do I feel the same way? So I'll blow past this, but I do want to talk about a really important project um, in my research anyway, which is from uh, Lauren McCarthy. And she has done a lot of works over the years that kind of push and pull at this tension. And her project script, she used a wiki, which again is a very accessible online tool that not only individual users, but institutions can um, you know, easily incorporate into their models. And the idea is that for a series of a whole month, she would post a script of what she was going to do the next day onto this wiki, and through her blog, um, people could log into the wiki and change the script. They could say, now you're going to go to the car parts dealer, or now you're going to brush your teeth for seven minutes. And she would have to do this and act it out. And one of the cool things that happened, you can see up here in the one image that I've pulled, is that it was all video documented within a gallery space. So there was this kind of weird, almost virtuality of taking place in a, in a white cube as like a TV studio. Um, but it became this hybrid kind of um, embodied performance that was being infused by the, um, the directions of anonymous virtual users. But the same users came back day after day, maybe not to edit, but to look at the script and stay engaged with the blog as a kind of mediating device in this mixed reality experience. Um, so my last slide, um, which is, again, more of a provocation, because I haven't talked about virtual reality and the role of virtual exhibitions. Um, here in Canada, John Raffman, who I've also followed closely for many years, he's a great innovator if you're not familiar with his work. Um, he has started creating his own custom environments within virtual reality in order to um, display work. However, I, as much as I respect him, I really can't philosophically get on board with this. I think that it's really important to material, um, sorry, I'm getting mixed up here. Digital, digital media is a material. It's material in ways that we enact by embodying the space. And so I, this is pulled from the FIVARS Festival, which happened in 2015, and this was the, one of their advertisements for, as an, an image um, promoting their festival. There's no engagement going on here, and I know that it's just a snapshot pulled from a marketing promo, but I don't think this is the direction that we should be heading in. We need to find ways to more seamlessly um, create mixed reality environments so that we can engage with digital content but stay engaged with one another. All right, I think I'll end it there. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we have our final speaker. Um, just before I continue, are we going to have a break after the final speaker and then questions, or are we just going to keep going? We're going to keep going. Okay. Okay, great. So um, our final speaker today is Srinivas Krishna. And um, he's the founder and CEO of the pioneering mobile AR studio, Awe Company, and the mobile AR platform, Geogram 2017. Srinivas Krishna has created both foundational AR technologies and some of the most remarkable AR experiences of the past de decade. A patented inventor, user experience designer, and lifelong innovator, his work as a digital media artist has been applauded by the Globe and Mail as utterly breathtaking genius. Previously, Srinivas has produced and directed feature films that have premiered at Toronto, Sundance, and Cannes, and have been distributed worldwide. He launched his career in 1991 with the international hit Masala, which was um, voted by the British Film Institute among the top 10 Asian diaspora films of the 20th century, and is a classic of world cinema. And I think anyone who's seen that film absolutely would have to agree. <laughs> um, 
The, the uh, near universal adoption of smartphones gives museums and galleries the unprecedented opportunity to engage audiences and build loyal communities. Srinivas Krishna provides a framework for imagining and shaping the visitor experience before, during, and after the exhibit, and examines the digital tools and methods, including augmented reality, that will help museums and galleries succeed in the digital space. So let's welcome Srinivas to the podium. Uh, Thanks uh, to OAG and Zainab and the staff here for making this happen, giving me a chance to speak to you, and thanks very much for uh, this opportunity. Really happy to be here. Um, I guess in the interest of disclosure, as you pointed out before, I'm just going to tell you uh, where I speak from. Uh, I'm a guy who went to art school, uh, made some movies and digital art projects and, you know, had a pretty comfortable life, and for 20 years I did that, and then I'm through a series of, you know, decisions that most everyone who cared about me tried to persuade me were completely irrational and downright stupid, I embarked on a journey that has now led me to this bizarre place of running a leading high-tech company. So here I am, uh, and it's from this perspective today that I'm going to speak to you about mobile AR, VR, augmented and virtual reality, and um, how do I... Uh, yeah, so what I'm going to talk about, yeah, tech, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is mobile AR, VR, what it is and how it works uh, very quickly, uh, and really, like, why it matters, you know, what problem are we trying to solve, and the opportunity that's, you know, at hand with this technology that everyone's kind of hearing about and, like, what it means. Uh, I'm going to talk about... Uh, an, you know, an exhibit that we made uh, at Fort York, uh, and the lessons that we learned from it, which were really expensive and painful, uh, I'm going to share those with you, and, and, and some of the responses that, you know, we're uh, uh, coming back with on the back of that, like a, a publishing desk geogram that we're building, and, and an ARVR learning lab that I hope might interest you. Um, so very, oops, did I go to the end? It's over. Sorry about that. Right, okay, so let's just talk about what it is. You know, until now when we look at, you know, mo you know the mobile web, uh, Web 2.0, uh, what it really in the simplest way means is that we're looking at 2D and 3D content on our screens. That's it. Uh, when we talk about the mobile web 3.0, mobile AR, VR, what we are saying is that that content is spatialized. You know, it doesn't just live on our screens, it lives or appears to live in the world and it refers to things, the material world. So like those two characters, they, they're standing and they appear to be standing in front of you when you look through your camera device in the world in front of you. When you look around, they're not there. When you look through again, they're there. Um, and it uses the camera and other sensors on the device to enable this. Uh, how it works uh, is, you know, I'll keep it really simple. Uh, there's two ways to make this work in mobile AR. Uh, one is using markers, which you've all seen before. It's like a QR code or an image that is recognized, and, and it triggers some content. Now, essential to this is, you know, an understanding of the location of the user in the real world. By which I mean we need to know where they're standing in three-dimensional coordinates, and we also need to know their, you know, angle of view. Are they looking down? Are they looking up? Are they looking straight? And that we call a pose. So we need to know their position and pose. And if we know that, we can deliver or render that content in a way that looks plausible to them. And we can use an image to do that and recognize an image. And this is useful in a gallery context if you want to trigger you know, a video or any kind of digital content in relation to an object that you want it to refer to. Um, now, the other way is what we call markerless augmented reality, and we don't use markers. What we do, rather, is we create a 3D map of the world, a 3D model, and we track 
you know, the movement and position of the user in that 3D model, and we track their pose using the onboarding, you know, the sensors, we get knowledge around that, what they're looking, where they're looking, how they're looking, and we use that information to then deliver content so that it appears to be in the world that they're actually inhabiting. You know, that's it. How does it look like? I'll just show you uh, a very early prototype that we built that is uh, that shared mixed reality space that you're referring to. Um, let's see here. This is in a place called the Block House in Fort York. Um, and what we did was we created a 3D model of that interior and we created a virtual you know, model of it and populated it with digital content. So we walk around with iPads, we discover these characters and they interact with us. Over they know here, that we're child. there. Let me have a word with you. It's a character talking to tonight. one person. I remain to battle brother Jonathan in service of his majesty the king. And I'm watching both of them. Has the devil in real tied time. your feet? Go, I said. I said, go. So he knows that oh, that person's standing right in front of him and can respond to him physically. So again, there's the 3D model and those characters walking in the 3D, you know, virtual world and they appear to Men, us in the real world. I have a message from the captain. The Yankees are off our shore at daybreak. All of you upstairs will leave with the captain to greet the enemy. And it's a shared multi-user experience. Three cheers, I say! Huzzah! 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 So the advantage of the markerless system is that it enables a couple of things. It enables the content to be persistent. So it is always there. You can look away, and when you look back, it's still there. And that makes it feel very real. The other thing it enables is a shared experience that we're all looking at the same thing at the same time in real time, you know, and that also makes it real. So this idea that it's really there becomes, you know, really pressing and, and, and immediate and powerful. So I want to ask why is this important to you? You know, your curators, artists, galleries, like who cares? Um, and it's a good question, you know, because really what problems can this solve and what does it solve? Uh, for you. And, and, and I have to say that when I got into it, what it saw for me was the idea of storytelling, of audience engagement, and really by which I think we have to understand it means audience development. You know, how do we develop audiences for our work? How do we relate to them? And how do we communicate to, to them? And how do we make it really, you know, beautiful uh, and pressing and, and exciting? So, I want to just go back and think about this problem and say, well, how did we used to do this once upon a time, not too long ago? Uh, we, you know, put out an ad. We put a listing in the news. And that would result in people coming to our venue and looking at our art. That's how we did it. And there was a whole, you know, value chain around this, you know, the whole economy of agencies, copywriters, you know, graphic artists who would we'd engage and this would go out into the world and there was the newspapers who would publish this and they may not charge a gallery a lot but they charged department stores a lot and use some of that money to create spaces for art you know, and, you know performing arts, visual arts and the like. Um, today, it's a different story altogether. I mean, newspapers are barely surviving. You know, and in this era of social media and the post-internet as you called it, you know, the presence of, you know, you know uh, algorithmically, you know, dry, you know, driven audience outreach systems, where is our audience? You know, like, what does it take to get people? Um, recently, a guy who promotes movies said, two, you know, two years ago, $100,000 in, in an ad budget, he could fill theaters. Today, he says $100,000 gets you nothing. You know, the cost of advertising, of promoting on social media and on the internet is just through the roof. So, and I'll just talk about it by the numbers. I mean, when we look at the damage to this, you know, value chain, this pipeline, it's huge. You know, in 2001, newspapers were a hundred, more than a hundred million dollars in, in ad revenue globally. Today, they're less than 20. And it's, you can see the growth of digital by the shrinking of newspapers. And this is really what's happened when we think about how do we reach audience? How do we communicate what we're doing? How do we find the people who, you know, uh, want to know what we're up to.
So that's really, I think, where AR, VR, and mobile AR, VR can make a difference. Uh, and and it's, it's not going away. It's going to be huge. And, you know, in the past four quarters, $4 billion has been invested in this space. Uh, in three years, there's going to be more than 3 billion devices that are capable of delivering mobile AR, VR experiences. And the ad market size in three years is going to be, you know, more than $30 billion. And when you look at the share in the Americas, that's almost 40%. It's more than a billion dollars here alone. And we think of Canada, 10% of that's a hundred, two hundred you know, million dollar you know, market here. So when we think, are we advertisers as galleries, as artists? Well, we're storytellers and we need to be here if we're going to you know, um, capture some of this. And it's not enough to think, oh, we're going to wait. You know, uh, and, and I say this because I don't think we can change the internet as it is today. You know, it is pretty much what it is. It's not going to go away and it's going to continue being what it is until it gets really degraded. And we see this time and again with mature, you know, you know businesses and ecosystems, they kind of just self-degrade. Their business model is not going to change. So here, with this new interface and this new kind of media, we have a chance to really change not just the experience, but also how we, you know, further that as a business and make it useful for all of us who are, you know, want to participate. So, I'm just going to talk about, in that context, we started a project several years ago uh, at Fort York with precisely this idea of how do we make this site that is really kind of, you know, in need of a story because its story is completely um, kind of submerged under the condos that have grown up around it, you know, the, the Gardner Expressway. No one knows it's there. No one knows what happened here. So we started this project, uh, and, and the brief was eight dramatic recreations across this nine-acre site, you know, which gets tens of thousands of people a year. And the idea was the experience should take less than two hours, you know. Um, and so we started this. Uh, what we did was we created a 3D model a 3D map of that entire nine acres. And we put up beacons in that virtual world for audio exhibits where you can walk up to them and you know, it would trigger an audio or it would trigger a virtual recreation. And through a smartphone put inside a little case you know, to keep out the sun, you could see those beacons and you'd say, oh, I'm going to check that out. And you get information about it and you'd walk over to it. And when you walked over, it, sorry. It knew you were there. It knew you were there and it would trigger an experience, which goes something like this. So this was the first instance of any kind of mobile AR, VR experience that was a consumer experience in the world. And it was the largest of its kind, and it really put our company on the map and, and made us kind of a legend in this you know, emerging industry, because we did something that no one had done. Um, we had, uh, these were the kinds of results that we got from user surveys that were done. Uh, and I won't, you know, outline them, but it was phenomenal in terms of the kind of engagement and understanding that people had of that site and what the story was there. Um, lessons. Well, making it was really bloody hard. It was really hard, it was expensive, and it was difficult, and so we learned this has to be easy to do. No one's going to do this, and we can't keep doing this, we're going to die, you know, if we keep doing it. Uh, and secondly, it's a real challenge for marketers. You know, the people who were the city of Toronto, which, you know, has a great group of marketers, just couldn't bring themselves to market it. They didn't know how, they didn't know where the audience was, they didn't know how to do it, and it was a new thing, and people are always comfortable doing the same old thing. So we thought, we really need to respond to this, you know, if we're going to grow, and if this whole space is going to grow that we became committed to. So our response is to build out something that we call Geogram, and it's a client-managed AR publishing desk. You know, that essentially allows you to upload and create, you know, create and upload your content and deliver it 
to users wherever they are, wherever you want them to be, or wherever, wherever you want them to experience something. And there's a mobile applications that go with it that you can use as is, or you can embed into other people's apps. Uh, what it enables you to do is promote what you're doing in virtual screens across the city. Sounds completely futuristic, but it's happening. It's, you can do that. Uh, you can enhance the experience for people who come to your site. And this is, what I think, what you were talking about, is how do we make this a shared experience for people? Uh, and you can leave digital content with them, digital swag, if you will. Uh, and you can publish content to your very own followers on your channel. You know, on Geogram, you can say, and it's, your, it's yours to manage. We don't have algorithms that, you know, get you those people. It's like people who come to your site, you can convert them to sign up and start communicating with them and having a relationship, giving them experiential content. Um, now, I talked about marketers, and it's not just creating a set of tools. We said, let's partner with people who are going to help advance this. And so we started a partnership with Now Magazine um, just recently. And we know, you know, Now for the past 38 years has really been, you know, central to the promotion of the arts in the city of Toronto. Uh, they're really part of the lifeblood of, you know, the community in that way. And yet, they're in the marketplace. You know, much like us, you know, we're a business, we, um, we're in the marketplace. So we thought, but this is a, this is a relationship that we can, we can develop to grow this, this whole pipeline, you know, for, for the arts. Um, what we're doing, where we're starting, is Dundas Square. We're taking it over. You know, when you go there, as of Halloween, which is just a couple of weeks away when we're launching, you can look through your screen, you know, your phone, on the Now app, and you'll see a virtual Dundas Square. And we're basically migrating the magazine idea and the listings idea and the local, you know, listings idea onto the cityscape as a shared mixed reality space. Um, and just to give you a sense of what that might look like, this was a test we did about six weeks ago, and these are our screens you know, covering the square. And we just used dummy ads that we found to do it, but this is sort of what it might appear like. Okay? Um, so this is essentially what we're trying to build with Now and with our platform is a new audience development pipeline using AR, VR. And in this, we've now started, a, you know, a relationship with the Media Lab at the Canadian Film Centre to help people learn how to make that content. You know, and the one missing part of this, you know, audience development pipeline is, of course, you. You know, it's, and this is what, you know, we're thinking, how do we now, now that we have a, a pipeline to market, you know, uh, content and, 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 you know, your work, how do we bring you into this? How do we, you know, give you an opportunity or a framework for it. And so the three of us, the CFC Media Lab, Geogram, and, and, and now are developing something that we're calling the ARVR Learning Lab. And essentially what it does is it's for in the arts community, for not just galleries, but also performing arts and other arts communities. Uh, it's a six-month program, and it's really about coming there with a show that you want to work with, work on, and develop an audience for. Uh, and you learn how to produce and publish, you know, and work in this new medium. Uh, develop an engaged audience over six months. Promote your show. Generate sales or, you know, visitation or however you measure success. And throughout the process, and at the end, we analyze what we've learned and share best practices. And the goal is really to generate sales, visitation, and to learn together. And, you know, this is not anything that any of us are experts in. You know, we each have an area that we understand, and it's about how do we come together to really understand this and get ahead of the curve and make it that service that is going to work for all of us in the way that I think in 2001, which was the last moment when we really had a viable ecosystem for promoting and, you know, our work, how do we come back to something that is viable? and that we can work with. And that's really the goal of it. So if you're interested, there's an email. Just send us an email with, you know, that subject and just send your contact details and we'll get back to you. Uh, we're looking at launching this in the spring, you know, and, and running it through. Um, and that's 
what I have to say today. Thank you very much. I think, I think what I'll do is I'll just um, ask all of you, I have, I'm sure everyone has a lot of questions, but I too have some questions. So I think I'll just start out by asking a question. Um, Jean, you were at the uh, Daniel Langlois um, Foundation, and one aspect that we haven't discussed uh, all that much today is the role of the archive. And that was something that you were very involved with there. And I, I just, somebody, I think we did talk a little bit about developing collections and, what, and the cost of developing collections. And another aspect of collection development and production on the part of the museum has to do with the archive. And I wonder if you could just speak to that a little bit in terms of digital content and dealing with archives. Yes, thank you for asking. It, it gives me the opportunity to uh, mention a few things. Um, um, for instance, uh, wh when I got at the Daniel Langlois Foundation, I was just coming out of the National Gallery. The National Gallery has a huge library. So if you do research in any subject pertaining to the visual arts, it's full of uh, you know documents, books, catalogs, everything, and they have, obviously, archives uh, about Canadian artists. But being media arts curator, I couldn't find very much there. Obviously, I uh, um, triggered the gallery to buy more books about, you know, media arts, video art, and all those, those things. But by and large, there was very few. So I realized that there was a need for a documentation center dedicated to uh, media arts, new media, digital art. So when I arrived at the Daniel Landler Foundation, I created what we, are, what we call the Re Center for Research and Documentation. And we acquired archives, basically. Very few works, basically no works of art, a few videotapes, but basically it was archives. And uh, such archives as um, uh, Steiner and Woody Vesulka archives, uh, which is in Montreal, um, the Nine Evenings of Theatre and Engineering archive, basically, for those interested, because we heard about it uh, this morning, the paper archive of nine evenings are at the Getty in Los Angeles. In Montreal, what we have is the audiovisual archive. So we have all the original footage from 1966. Uh, 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 and then uh, video footage that Billy Clover uh, created in the 90s because he was doing documentaries about each of the performances. So all that material is in Montreal, and plus other archives. So we tried to develop this um, collection of documentation and archives. Um, what happened then is that it, it's all good as long as your financial backer is there. My fa financial backer, Daniel Langlois, eventually decided to pull the plug. So that's why nowadays we don't hear about the Langlois Foundation anymore. Uh, while it was very well known during between 2000 and 2010, um, so talking about collections this morning, I think collections are very exciting. It's a very exciting um, endeavor to develop a collection. But you have to have the means. It's very costly. The preservation is a cost. And uh, it takes a lot of space. So, and I could go on and on because I have experience after that at the Cinémathèque Québécoise, which is in Canada the largest private film collection, holding 300,000 film reels for 50,000 titles. So there, again, you need huge storage, uh, cold storage, 
uh, different temperature, different type of storage. So it's huge and very, very, very costly. And digital preservation, it's even more complicated and even more costly. So. <laughs> Thanks. Hopefully we can pick up on that. David, um, you mentioned something at the very beginning of your talk about social disability, a kind of philosophy of the disabled person within society. And um, uh, many years ago, I, I, worked for the, um, I worked with the BC Coalition of the Disabled, and I remember we were working on this premise, this idea, and one of the theories was that when you look at the disabled-bodied person as someone who needs to be, quote unquote, fixed in some way, that that is the abnormal state of being, that uh, society as a whole actually misses out on something really important. Whereas if you, if you see the... Um, that what you think of as a disability is actually something that can pass a lot of knowledge on to other people, then um, the whole of society actually benefits. And your technologies actually seem to be doing that in um, a very, very interesting context. And it makes me think that there must be a lot of um, spin-off and transferability of the knowledge that you develop to, toward more general social situations. And I w wonder if you could speak to that. Well, yeah, uh, there's a lot there. <laughs> um, uh, I think, I mean, first and foremost, I think the, the important thing that anything that we do in terms of uh, responding to the needs of, of uh, someone who is deaf or someone who is disabled is in going to, it's going to enrich all of us. Uh, the experience is going to be enriching for all of us. Um, so, but yeah, I think the whole thing about ability as opposed to disability. Um, and um, I think the other two, thing too is like there's no sort of like lumping people together into a, you know, a, a sort of a definition. Um, you know, as we all, we're all individual, we're all unique, we all have uh, experiences. Um, and when you're given the opportunity to um, um, express that experience or given, so to speak, a voice, um, it's an entirely different uh, perspective. Um, I think one of, well, there's all kinds of things that are sort of have to happen and are happening in this movement. Um, and that is, um, you know, critical uh, evaluation. How do we look at, how do we examine this work? Who examines it? Where does this information, where's the context come from? Um, what's the language that we use? I think all of that has to be changed and it all has to come from those communities. Um, so um, I guess what I would also say is in terms of issuing sort of a challenge to everyone is that uh, if you, you, we do have to go in this direction first and foremost uh, because we do have an ad aging population in addition to, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the normal sort of population of, of disabled or deaf. Um, so um, is that is to bring those people into your uh, your staffing, uh, bring people from those communities in to meet, talk about what they would imagine this space to be like. Uh, one of the things that was interesting yesterday, uh, and I'm sorry, I forget his name, the uh, uh, fellow from Montreal, indigenous uh, from, uh, uh, man from Montreal, uh, and the Indigenous Future Project. I mean, that would be amazing. Uh, if we could d develop something like that, that we could come from uh, the deaf community or disabled community. Um, and I know that, like, we're all familiar with this sort of new funding uh, program uh, system or available through the Arts Councils, which is remarkable. Um, and the definitions, of course, deaf and disabled are very distinctively different. Um, we have to, you know, explore that very carefully. Um, well, there's all kinds of uh, Eliza Chandler, who I quoted earlier, says that uh, her, her position is that all disability arts is political. Um, and so I think in that, 
uh, it, it, I'm uh, very excited about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited about the politics uh, involved around that. And, uh, uh, and I think, you know, I, yeah, be open uh, and, and, uh, and invite uh, people in and uh, have that discussion. I, I hope that's helped. No, I, I think that's, that's the, you, 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 you got to it, the, the political aspect of how it, it, it has the potential to challenge the sort of hegemonic position of the museum and the colonial past of the museum indirectly, you know, to really break it down. So it's really, really fascinating. It's a huge area. And that brings me <laughs> to you, Zach, because I really, I, I see your um, vision and uh, your ideas as really potentially challenging the, the space of the museum, but in a way that makes it m far more relevant. So I'm going to ask you a really, really pointed question here. Um, you're, you're in this space, the Robert McLaughlin Gallery, and um, if, you could, if you could do one thing that would involve augmented reality or would involve um, the shared space of virtual reality, how, how would you do it? What would you do? What would be one thing that you would do here in this museum uh, today, if you were given free run, to, to open up the space? Okay. That is putting me on the hot seat. Um, I guess as I look around within this gallery, there are so many different um, references to histories, um, social histories. There's a lot, um, as we talked about earlier in the day, um, this kind of tricky middle space of how things are curated and collated and what the, no matter the good intentions, what the kind of, um, you know, those are all informed by subjectivities, personal uh, reasons, or maybe the time dictates it, uh, you know, a, a current issue. So when I look at a gallery space like this, and obviously we have a few, you know, there's a few different kind of camps of ideas going on in here. But one of the things that I hear, um, well, first of all, that I read in, um, I, I look a lot at um, the area of interpretive planning in museums. This is the, you know, the design of communication and how different age levels are spoken to through the didactics, through the exhibition design. And um, one thing that's really prominent in our, in our culture right now that I think that's informed by post-internet culture is that there's a real um, tendency to want to know, to see things in a referential way, to see things as, in a way, kind of just linked inherently to one another, and to be that everything has this kind of, um, this backstory behind it that, you know, normally through our phones, we can, we can access at least some of it very easily. So I think in a space like this, maybe let's limit it just to within this gallery that we can see right now. I think um, through, and it wouldn't necessarily have to be through AR, because some of the ideas that I am working on right now have to do with analog ways to sort of mimic or recreate um, virtual protocols and behaviors so that there's ways to do that. I think that they, they can be a kind of back and forth between those things. But especially through something like AR, to be able to see where these images appear elsewhere, the kinds of major places and names that they're associated with, and the idea we talked about yesterday with tagging and being able for people to participate socially and be able to tag and, and create those relations to other things, and for that to be visible for other people to experience. So I guess in a kind of way, like a, a mapping of, of how ideas and subject matters are interrelated. Um, and it could exist in a very, you know, text-based way, or it might, I guess, you know, I would propose in, in a gallery, it should be a very visual, you know, enticing way. If you can, um, I don't know, we have different age groups here, but like, um, <laughs> anybody a fan of Donnie Darko, the movie Donnie Darko? <laughs> so like, maybe there's just a little glowing orb that sort of like leads you from one, you know, relation to the next, from piece to piece. I don't know, Srinivas will have to um, sort of attest to the viability of that. But I, I think there are ways to do it that doesn't disrupt the aesthetics of the work itself. It adds to it and um, can drive you spatially through, through the museum, through the, yeah, through the gallery experience. Great. 
Well, that's okay. Two more minutes, apparently. <laughs> okay, Srinivas, you don't have a lot of time for this very, very difficult question. The um, artist Haroon Faruqi has uh, talked about, in, in terms of virtual reality and the image, the breakdown of indexicality between um, the virtual and the referential. And I wonder in terms of the work that you're doing, I mean, I, a couple of years ago I was in Toronto and I saw a work that was done by a group of artists who came from Berlin who put together something called Situation Rooms. And um, I think Situation Rooms used a lot of this sort of augmented reality technology that you're talking about using the iPad. And I just wonder, in terms of where this is going, so you seem to have a, an idea of where this is going, what's going to happen to that indexical relationship to reality? That's a good question. Um... I, there's a few ways things are going to go, like they always do. Um, there's, uh, you know, virtual reality is really uh, an immersive experience that can be anything and refer to nothing that you may know or care to know. Um, and we have really resolutely stayed away from that space, and the path that we take is really contextual knowledge. So that's why I talked about how important the position of the user is, because if you know where they are, then you can give them an experience or information that is relevant contextually to them and to the environment that they're in, or to the object that they're contemplating. Um, and the stories that are relevant to that place, that object, to that person. Um, and I think that's where things are really going to go. Uh, when we look at the distribution uh, capabilities of augmented reality in terms of the mobile phones and how big it's going to be and how big it already is. I mean, this year there's almost more than a billion devices that are capable of it. And that's the argument I make to finance this crazy thing that we're doing at Dundas Square. You know, it's like, well, a lot of people can see this. So it's, um, and I think that's where we're going to see a lot of... Uh, traction and a lot of interest is because it brings value to people. I mean, the less indexical that relationship is, the less valuable it is on so many levels to your average individual. It may, you know, be meaningful in any number of other ways, but those are unique in particular to that work and that person and that, you know. But in general, I think what you're going to see is more and more indexical relationships between virtual content and real things. 